If this is your first Sunday, it's just worth mentioning that as a church, you come, I think, our fourth week in our new series entitled Dramatically Death by Love. And um, as a church, we have taken the somewhat unusual step of working our way through a book. This book here, written by a guy called Mark Driscoll. And it's all about one person. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, it's all about Jesus. And I don't know, if I was to ask you, what would you need to hear to, to classify as good news? What would you need to hear to classify as good news? So maybe if you're a student here, if, if I said, stop press, we've just heard, all exams forever have been cancelled. <laughs> would that be good news? Yes, it would. If I said, for you teachers and those who work at school, I've just heard the government's made a new policy. You finished term last Friday. You've got a two-month Christmas break. Would that be good news? <laughs> yes, it would. And so on. If I was to say what would be good news to you, you'd fill in the blank and you'd come up, come up with something. But if you've been here for more than a few weeks, you would have heard us as Christians banging on about this thing called the gospel, which literally means good news. And we make the somewhat bold, maybe even audacious claim that even greater than whatever you would have put in that blank, that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, yes, it is good news, but it's, it's capital G N. It's the greatest news. It's so much greater than anything else you may have put in that blank. And you may say, Tom, 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 how on earth can you make such a claim? Well, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you would have heard, for example, we met someone called Susan. Susan was a real woman that this guy Mark wrote to who was in her church. And for Susan, the reason that Jesus and the gospel was such amazing news was because that she was looking for God. She was on a search for God. And we learned a few weeks ago that the gospel is good news because it shows us God. Jesus shows us God. Jesus, the revelation. Then we heard about a guy called Thomas. And the reason the gospel was such good news for Thomas was because actually he was enslaved to so much sin. And as we heard, Jesus sets us free from sin. He is our redeemer, to lose a, use another long word. Last week, Hugh preached brilliantly, and he, and he gave us another angle on why the gospel is the greatest news, because Jesus cleanses us from our sin. And today, we're going to hear about another man, a, a real man called Bill, and for him, the particular aspect of the gospel that he needed to hear that would change his life forever was this. Even more than Jesus the revelation, Jesus the redeemer, and Jesus the cleanser was this. Jesus the wrath bearer. I knew the room would go silent when I said the W word, wrath. Now if you're here thinking, oh my goodness, I was enjoying things up until that moment, and now I'm going to pretend to go to the loo and just make a mad dash for the door. Just, just stay where you are for a moment. Bear with me, because... I sympathize with you in the fact that when I think of the word, when I hear the word wrath, I think of Mr. Crombie, my Scottish French teacher at school, who was perpetually red-faced and perpetually full of wrong wrath and angry at everyone for everything, from their pronunciation to their grammar. He was always wrathful in the wrong kind of way. And often when we think about the word wrath, it just seems over the top. It just seems ridiculous. And actually, what we need to do today is... Look at the Bible and realize that the, the idea of God being a God of anger and wrath, it is accurate. It is accurate. But it's not just accurate, as we're going to see today, it's actually appropriate. And as we're going to see also, it's not just accurate and appropriate, but actually it's essential. If we are ever to become a people who, when we hear about being saved, Christians always talk about being saved, what the heck are you being saved from? Well, we have to understand what we are in danger from if we are actually ever going to be grateful for this thing of salvation. Does that make sense? So today, we're going to hear about Bill. Bill, and for Bill, he needed to understand that actually the reason the gospel is such amazing news is because Jesus has borne the righteous wrath of God for everyone in this world. Let's read about Bill. And maybe you might identify a little bit with Bill. There we go. I'm a bit blind nowadays. Now I'm 32, 31. Oh. With a beautiful wife, cute kids, a solid career, and a fruitful ministry, Bill seemed to be living the idyllic life. As we ate chicken wings, I inquired about his upbringing. 
expecting to hear that he was raised by godly parents who were responsible for much of his success. He spoke lovingly of his mum and siblings, but said nothing about his father. Curious, I asked him about his dad, at which point his countenance changed, and he said, my dad's a Christian. It was rather obvious that there was more to the story, so I continued probing and asked him to tell me about his dad. But explained that his grandfather was a drunk who routinely beat his wife and kids, including his dad, when he was a boy. And so grandpa was so violent that he put his kids in hospital on more than one occasion. When he came home drunk, the kids would run for their lives, seeking a place to hide in the woods near their home. And as a result, the kids spent many days sleeping in various hiding places outside, hoping their dad would not find them. Growing up with this constant violence affected Bill's father, who continued much of this abusive behavior. And as a result, Bill grew up routinely watching his mum being dragged around the house by her hair. If any of the kids tried to intervene, they were also screamed at slapped in the face, punched, thrown to the ground, and sometimes kicked while they lay on the floor, even the girls. And this abuse continued for many years, and Bill grew increasingly tough with a strong sense of duty and justice. He channeled his bitterness he had for his father towards perceived good and was an overachiever in school, sports, work, religion, and anything else he committed himself to. Outwardly, he was a very self-sufficient and good young man, but inwardly, he was filled with rage and bitterness towards his dad. And Bill first moved out of his father's home as a very young boy, around the age of three or four. And he so hated his dad, he even built a fort in the yard and decided he would live there alone. His mum eventually came out crying and asked him to move back into his dad's house. And Bill did so out of love for his mum. But his heart was never in that house. Later in college, Bill's whole life changed when he became a Christian. And for the first time, he felt the father hole in his heart being filled with the love of God. And he deeply desired to learn the Bible and honour God. But in the ensuing years, Bill married a lovely Christian woman with whom he had great kids. And he was proud that the the cycle of violence he that had destroyed generations of his family ended with him. He never raised a fist against his wife or kids. But he conveniently overlooked the fact that while he did not hit his wife with his fists, he did abuse her with his words. His anger would erupt much like his father's because in part he had not forgiven his father for being an unjust and violent man. And a root of bitterness had entered his soul. Then one day, God also saved Bill's dad. Bill was skeptical at first, but over time was convinced that his father had indeed met Jesus. And on the one hand, was truly glad to see his dad meet Jesus, but on the other, he felt unsure of how to respond. His friends just said, oh, you've got to forgive him. But but this seemed an answer that was trite. As a father himself, he would sometimes try and imagine what his dad had done in his family. And to be honest with you, it was terrible. And he couldn't imagine doing this. And so to make matters worse, Bill had seen the effects of his father's sin on the entire family. To Bill, simply erasing the past as if nothing had ever happened and moving on because his dad got saved seemed to ignore, listen to the word, the injustice. His feelings on the matter were quite right. Despite the sin of bitterness that he had allowed in his heart. And this letter is written to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you Lord Jesus that you have an answer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have an answer and you're here today to come and to bring your grace upon us. Lord, we love you. We welcome you. And we thank you you are here now to help us in our weakness. You are the answer this world is looking for. We love you and we welcome you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. There's two main things that you need to know about God. The Bible, that's probably a slight oversimplification, but... For the sake of today, there's two main things. God is a God who, of righteous wrath. Of righteous wrath. But he's also a God of bizarre love. A God of righteous wrath and a God of bizarre love. And I, I use those words deliberately because often we actually kind of think of them the, the other way around. We think of his wrath as being somewhat bizarre and a bit over the top. I'm not that bad. And we think of his love for us as kind of appropriate. We're pretty lovable. We've done a lot of good things and it's kind of right. It's kind of righteous. But what I want to do in the next few moments is show that we genuinely have those the wrong way around. And if you were to take all the verses in the Bible about God being a God of love and you were to stack them up into a big mountain and then you were to take all the verses in the Bible about being a God of anger and wrath or words akin to that and you were to stack those up, the amazing thing is this, is that those mountains are both 
equal or thereabouts in size. But often we unconsciously only kind of focus on one mountain. You know, the verses that we all remember are John 3.16, for God so loved the world, and we're into the love mountain. And we kind of, oh, there's that there, but <laughs> the love. And that is totally an aspect of God, and we are going to get there. But as I've said, we, if we are going to be honest to this book, the Bible, we have to understand that there is another mountain of verses in the Bible that is equally true, that actually equally will lead us into a place of worship if we allow them by the power of the Holy Spirit to do their work in us. So first of all then, God is a God of righteous wrath. And we need to unpack this a little bit. You see, Bill, as you've heard, felt real anger at his dad, didn't he? He felt great anger because of the things his dad had done. And his dad, put it bluntly, had failed him. There's an incident we read about where Bill comes home and he's got straight A's. And he's like, Dad, look. And his dad just goes, fluke. You'll, you'll end up in prison. You'll end up needing me to bail you out at some point. And he cuts him down. And so physically and emotionally, Bill's father had profoundly failed his son and his family. Not in a subtle way, in a really major league way. And so this is the million dollar question. The anger that Bill felt that he communicated to Mark, was it appropriate? Because often, particularly in this country, if you ever feel anger for something and you're a Christian, you kind of think that's automatically wrong. We automatically think, well, that's a wrong thing to, th to feel. But what we have to understand is this. The Bible tells us, actually, God is a God who over certain things, most specifically sin, he is a God who is very angry. And so actually, Bill's feelings towards his father were actually appropriate. They were in some way mirroring the, the feelings of his father, sorry, of God the father, when he looked upon Bill's earthly father. So what does God feel? Well, first of all, we read in the Bible, if you've got a Bible with you, turn to Genesis 6. We're only six chapters into the Bible. And the first thing we have to understand about God's feeling towards sin is that when God sees sin, he feels grief. Look here, verse 5 of, of chapter 6. The Lord, it should come up on the, verse, on the um, PowerPoint behind me if you haven't got a Bible. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that, look at this. This is God's description of the world. Every intention, in, intention of, the hearts of, his, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth and it grieved him. It grieved him to his heart. You know, the Bible is really not flattering. Just you know, I mean, to state the obvious, we're a few chapters in, and this is like the beginning of this profoundly blunt assessment of earth, that it grieves him. You see, the Bible uses incredible language. It's, it's language a bit like, God says, my relationship to people is like a husband to a wife. You see it throughout these scriptures. You see, it's like God is married to the people that he's created. And so when we sin, the Bible tells us it's not just like a, oh, it's a kind of a, a bit of a hiccup. It tells us, it uses shocking language. It says that basically we have committed spiritual adultery. When we sin, when God looked down here, when he looks down this earth now and sees the sin that Bill's father committed, the sins that Bill committed, and to be honest with you, the, the sins that we've committed, it grieves him. It grieves him. It's like a husband coming home early from work, coming in to find his wife in bed with another man. It grieves him. Because we are designed, people were designed to be completely sold out only for our true husband, which is God. And then for when we allow our hearts to go and make other things gods, even if we don't call them that, in God's eyes, it's, first of all, it's a grief. It's like the air is taken from his lungs. <gasps> In the Bible, in the Old Testament, it uses the word whore 48 times. I mean, it's shocking. Another way of putting it is like, the Bible says it's like the relationship God has with us is like a father to his son, to his daughters. And so when, when it's like when, when we sin, it's almost like we're saying, Father, I don't want you as my father anymore. It's like coming home as a father, and rather than Daisy Lily running into my arms, it's like them saying, sorry, Dad, 
we're actually going to make this man our father now. Grief. I know it's shocking, but we, we have to allow the scripture to inform us. We have to feel what it tells us. It tells us that God is grieved when he sees the sins of this world. Yes, obvious sins, like Bill's dad beating his family, but when it's, it's subtle sin, it's making a good thing an ultimate thing. When your work slips from being a good thing to being the thing in your life, and it's actually your God. When the pursuit of a partner goes from being a good thing to being the ultimate thing, it, and it becomes your God. It's a sin that offends God, who only has to be the one who rules our hearts. And when we allow anything, subtle sin, obvious sin, to become the king on our hearts, it's idolatry, and it causes God profound cosmic grief. Grief, we can't, we're just sitting here, with it, we don't even understand this. He causes great grief to God, but not just grief. It causes anger. It causes anger. See, just as Bill felt more than just grief towards what his father done, he felt anger. And again, actually, that anger was shared by God. It says here, throughout Scripture, that when God sees the sin of the world, he is furious. He is furious. Exodus 4, 14 says, Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Numbers 11 says, The people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes, and when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. Psalm 78, 31 says, The anger of God rose against them. Psalm 75, 55, They provoked him to anger with their high places. Isaiah 5, 25, And then the anger of the Lord was kindled. I could go on all morning. God is furious when he sees sin in this world. He's furious. And when we think about it, we think, oh, Lord, just calm down a bit. Go and sit in a calm spot. Yeah, go and sit in, a, in, in the corner, Lord. Just have a glass of water, Lord. What is the big deal? Yes, there's some obvious, awful things, but is this really appropriate? The trouble is, is that when we think of anger, our our experience of anger is a very real mixture of getting anger, angry sometimes over the right things, but probably more often than not over really the wrong things. You know, your football team get relegated. The wrath emo- you know, erupts in our hearts. Sunday night, tonight, the X Factor person you love, <laughs> the public don't vote for them and they go out prematurely. Anger. You know, you're walking around your bed first thing in the morning and bosh, you stub your toe. What's the feeling? Anger. It's not just, you know, oh, that was painful. It's, it's anger. We feel anger over insanely ridiculous things, over things occasionally we get angry over seeing the right things, but often it's not. We get angry when someone around us gets praised and we don't. We get angry when someone around us gets promoted and we get overlooked. We get angry actually so often not because of the right things but because of the wrong things and so when we think of God getting angry we 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 see his anger kind of like how we see ours and we think it's just ridiculous but the Bible says no God's anger is pure it is totally pure numbers 14 says the Lord is slow to anger he's abounding in steadfast love God often relents from his anger and his love is, sorry, his, his, his anger is always over the right things. But it says this, it says also, but he will by no means clear the guilty. God can't just overlook sin. You know, can you imagine the scandal of a judge? And Hitler comes before him. And he just says, right, okay, yeah. Well, I tell you what, on your way now. Go on, on your way. We'll just ignore it. The fury in our hearts toward the injustice If that were to happen, God is perfect in his anger. He can't just clear the guilty of this world. It would mean he would have to stop being God. It would actually mean he would have to sin. (laughs) And he can't sin because he's perfect. And we might say, well, Tom, but all those verses you read, I noticed, were from the Old Testament. We all know that God had a bad mood in the Old Testament, but when Jesus came on, he was great. He was into recycling, he was, you know, he was, had long hair, he was like, yo, dude. He was like, you know, Brad off Neighbours. He was just kind of a nice, cool guy, wasn't he? He talked about love all the time. Yeah? Not quite. Not quite. We often have our anger filters on, and we have our love glasses on. We, we, we conveniently forget the fact that in Mark 3, Jesus, when confronted with hardness of heart, says, as he looked at them with anger, 
grieved at their hardness of heart. We conveniently can forget the fact that Jesus storms into the temple after seeing the fact that they are corrupting a sacred place and he turns the tables over. We conveniently forget the fact that when Jesus is talking to the leaders of the time, the Pharisees, and they are unbelievably self-righteous, unbelievably proud, he calls them sons of the devil. <laughs> That's God on earth. That's Jesus, meek and mild, high-fiving dude, recycler. No, Jesus got angry at sin because before he came to earth as God, he was angry at sin. And when he came to earth, he was still angry at sin. He was still angry at sin. <laughs> I mean, in Acts chapter 4, I think, or beginning of Acts, there's an instant that it would be funny if it wasn't so horrendous. The church is just like booming. And they have a love offering. But like next week, building offering. And there's a couple <laughs> called Ananas and Sapphira, and they sell some land, and they kind of give a bit, and they lie, and they pretend they give them more, and it grieves the Holy Spirit. And they get confronted, about it, and they lie. And they, in a moment, God just stops their life. They die. The anger of the Lord towards their sin is demonstrated in, beep, boop, session terminated. Your life stops. I mean, it's shocking. This is God. God is very, very angry at the sin of this world. And you might be Tom, look, look why, are you, why are you telling me this, Tom? This is somewhat, somewhat uncomfortable. The problem is, you might even be saying, Tom, are you trying to scare me? And I'd say, yes, I most certainly am. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It doesn't say the friendship of the Lord, the high five of the Lord, our buddy. No, no, it says the fear of the Lord. That's the place you start, it's the beginning of wisdom. The big place you actually start. Is, is thinking God is not some, you know, he's not a domestic cat. You can go, Meow. he is the lion of Judah, the Bible says. You don't stroke a lion, okay? You might stroke a little kitten. He is, he is different. He is holy. And, th and just think about this. If, if this is true, if this is true, that God really feels this way towards the earth, and I didn't tell you as a Christian, I would be the cruelest person in the world. I'd be the cruelest person in the world. It's like, you know, if I turn up to a campsite, Shaw family on holiday, we hit France, and we get there, and the guy goes, bonjour, it's a lovely campsite, uh, but just be careful, there is a cliff, I'll stop doing that, there's a cliff, and there's no railings, all right? It's a sheer drop, just to warn you, no problem. What would I do? Josie, get the girls, we're going straight to the cliff. Daisy, Lily, look at that. Don't jump over that, Daisy and Lily. I'd probably sort of dangle their legs or something, just make them feel the, the fear of it. I probably wouldn't really. I just mean, I'd be like, oh, save your life. <laughs> look, look. Because they wouldn't, under they'd be like, oh, let's try flying, you know. They're, I'd be like, Daisy, Lily, look at the danger. Be scared. If I didn't do that, I would be, I would be a horrific father. Yes, they experienced the temporary shock of seeing that, but... The benefits somewhat outweigh the minor pain of hearing the truth. And that's why we're doing this today. That's why both if you don't know Jesus, if you're looking into Christianity, or if you would say, yes, I do. Nevertheless, no matter where we sit on it, we have to be people who realize this is a huge part of what it is to believe the biblical God, is that God warns us repeatedly of who he is and how he feels about what's happening on planet Earth right now. But he doesn't just get angry. He doesn't just feel grief and anger at sin. He hates sin. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 6. It's near the, the middle of the Bible. Proverbs 6. In case you don't believe me that this is the Christian God. Verse 6. For, uh, sorry, verse 16 of chapter 6. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathe, breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Seven things that the Lord thinks are an abomination that he hates with all of his heart. And then we see there a list of seven sins that mankind frequently engages in. We should hate those things too. Psalm 97 says, Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. Now, the thing is, we kind of think we do, 
but often we don't. Think about what does this, you go down to Blockbusters, what is the wall, what are the walls filled with? They're filled with, story, uh, with films about people, violence, immorality, deceit, gossip, basically what we've just read. So what the world feeds on. What are the top selling video games? You know, they're not about skipping through the meadows and seeing how many daisy chains you can make. No, no, they're about beating people up, shooting them, dead. God hates that. I'm not trying to bring condemnation if that's a game you'll get. I'm just saying God says he hates violence. He hates it. He hates it. He hates it. What's the news at 10 all about? It's about countries falling apart. About dictators who are running to do evil. It's about division amongst the government. It's everything we've just read. God looks at it and goes, I feel sick. I hate this. We sit there and go, oh, oh, we feed on it. The world feeds on it. We do. And I'm not saying don't watch the news at 10. Don't just hear me. I watch it. But I'm saying that there is something fundamentally different about the holy God of the universe and the world in which we live. God hates sin. And I want to say this, and this is going to be controversial. He hates the sinner as well. He hates the sinner as well. Now, we often go, wait a minute, doesn't... I thought you said God loves us. He does love you, but he also hates you when you sin. And anyone here who has a loved one, you know that you can be capable of great love and great hate in the same moment. I adore Josie. Very much. She looks embarrassed. But there are times when I hate her. And there's, I think, occasionally when she might feel somewhat similar towards me. Probably not, but you know. Come on, let's not be stupid about this. You know, the trouble, you know, we, we quote that verse, you know, wait a minute, isn't there a verse in the Bible somewhere? It says, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. Nope, it's not actually in the Bible. It's not actually in the Bible. Because the problem is, when we think of that, we think of there's me, the sinner, and then there's sin here. And the two are like that. And he can, the trouble is, the Bible tells us that sin comes from here. It comes from our inner man. It comes from out the heart. Do we act? So the problem is, if God hates sin, it's kind of, oh, it's in me. Oh dear. You know, we don't say about people who repeatedly beat up grannies, we don't say, oh, I love granny bashers. I love them. I just hate their sin. No, no, if you know someone, you go, I, you are a bully and you deserve a big decking. You hate them. You do, if you're honest. And God hates them, and he loves them, but he hates them as well. And we always focus on the lot, and he hates them. He hates what they do. He hates sin. He hates sin, and we have to feel this. I know this may be a shade uncomfortable, we have to feel this. This is the God of the Bible. God doesn't just, is grieved at sin, he's not just angry at sin, he's not just, he doesn't just hate sin and sinners. He, he actually does pour out his wrath on those who sin. We see, turning your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Notice this is the New Testament. Okay, this isn't the old, this is the new. It says this right near the beginning of probably one of the greatest letters in the whole of the Bible. Verse 18 of chapter 1. Let's begin on a positive note, Paul, what you've got to say about the world. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. He's just said in the previous verses, I love this, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. And that's an interesting thing to say. Why would you be ashamed of it? Well, when you understand the true gospel, it is possible to feel shame when you understand that God actually says, I'm furious at the world. You can feel embarrassed about saying that. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It gets onto the love, but it starts with the re reality of how God sees this world. What is this wrath of God being revealed? Look with me a few verses later. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. And verse 24, therefore, look at this, God gave them up. There's like a passive wrath you see in the Bible, and it's when God gives you up. Like a father who has pleaded repeatedly with a teenage son 
who is hell-bent on living a life of massive self-destruction. And for endless amounts of time, the father and the mother have said, please don't do that. You don't know what you're doing. You're playing with fire. You're going to end up killing yourself. You're going to end up on a road to self-destruction. And the images of like, eventually, eventually, eventually there comes a point where they just go, well, just do it then. If you so want to do that, you see what it brings upon you. You see what you think is going to give you so much joy and so much satisfaction, you're going to bring like a wrath upon yourself. God doesn't even have to get involved actively. It's just as you do sin, it brings a wrath upon ourselves. It says this in Romans 6.23. It's fascinating. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Now, it's primarily talking there, I believe, about the fact that literally we die physically because we sin. But there's a secondary meaning here. That we mustn't miss. It's saying, as we work for the employer of sin, we think we're going to get paid brilliant stuff. And guess what we get paid? We get paid a kind of death. So Mr. Sin says, hi Tom, come and work for me. Come and, uh, tell you what, have a little gossip, okay? Have a little gossip and you'll feel great. So we have a little gossip and actually what we get paid is, I feel horrendously guilty. I shouldn't have said that. The wages are death-like. Or we, Mr. Sin says, tell you what, you've been wronged by that person. Give in to bitterness. Don't forgive them. Don't ever forgive them. Bitterness will be your friend. So we give in to bitterness and actually what we get paid is a death-like experience which eats us alive. A friend of mine, a relative, who literally is no longer, she's not alive anymore, an old lady um, who's a relative of mine in, in some connection, she, she was someone who in her life Yes, she'd had some tough things, but she had allowed it to become this colossal root of bitterness in her life. She had allowed herself to perpetually stay in I'm a victim for all of her life. And do you know what? Honestly, you look at photos of her in younger years, and she's like, and as she got older, and it wasn't a physical thing, but you could see her. It was like it had an effect on her. And when you spoke with her, it was like she, was, she had allowed bitterness to consume her. She had worked for the sin of bitterness and unforgiveness. And guess what it had given her? Guess what it paid her? That is passive wrath. It's the system. It's reap what you sow in this life. If we reap, sorry, if we sow into sin, actually what we reap is a passive kind of wrath and sin upon ourselves. But you know what? Finally, it's not just an, a passive type of wrath. The Bible terrifyingly warns us that if we don't get right with God, he won't just allow a passive wrath of sin but also an active wrath. What happened with Ananias and Sapphira in the early church will occur. You see in Exodus 32, 10, he says, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them. And 2 Kings 23 says, The Lord did not turn from his burning. And Colossians 3, 5, after a huge list of sins, it says, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Now, I know you're probably sitting here thinking, wow, well, maybe I should have come today. It's not the most uplifting of messages. But God is holy. That's so what I'm trying to communicate is that God is holy. And we live in a nation, to be honest with you, where the church doesn't preach this. It doesn't. We don't. Enough. We, we, we preach the mountain of love, and we kind of allude to the other one. We know we, in evangelical... At times now, the emphasis is on building cool church. You know, church that's kind of funky and inclusive. But it just sort of misses out a little bit of the, the gospel. What, Hebrews 13 says, I've got to give an account for God, to God, for how I've lived my life as a leader. And he's going to say to me, Tom, did you preach the whole gospel? Did you tell them the whole truth in the days that I gave you on planet Earth? I don't want to be there saying, Kind of, yeah, sort, sort of did, God. Th those bits, particularly I emphasised. You know, I like to make people laugh, God, you know. So I, I particularly emphasise those. I fear God. I really fear God. And I don't want to upset anyone. But this is the Bi what the Bible says. God's wrath, it is not irrational. It is not over the top. It is totally right, and it's... We get a glimpse of it when we think of, well, if God thinks of me as when I sin, when I've sinned, it's like I've committed spiritual adultery. It's like I've turned away from him as my father. Wow. No wonder. 
So in a way, this sermon should have one point. It should be the one-point sermon, shouldn't it? If God was just a God of justice, but like, there we go. That's the preach. Righteous wrath. On we go. And we'd all go, well, Bill's dad, Bill, me, us. God's a God of justice. And when we face him, he's going to go, right, there you go. This is what you get. An eternity separated from me. Eternal conscious punishment, hell. It's not irrational. It's not over the top. It's totally just, of course. If God were simply a God of justice, we would be finishing now. And that is where we would finish. But this is where the Bible, and I pray for now as I say this, that we will have fresh revelation as to how bizarre and amazing and astonishing it is. Because the Bible doesn't finish there. We see a God of incalculable, relentless, unimaginable love in the Bible. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John, 1 John 4, it's just after Romans, a little bit further on. In the context of all I've said, R.C. Sproul says this, he says, the most perplexing theological question is not why is there suffering in the world, this world is, as I've said, full of sinful people, it's not that perplexing, but this is the question, he says, the most theological perplexing question is why God tolerates us in our sinfulness. Why isn't Ananias and Sapphira type things happening every day? What's going on? How is it, if what I'm saying is true, how is it we are still breathing? Look at this word with me. 1 John 4, 10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son. Love is not about snuggling up on a sofa, <laughs> putting Barry White music on and having popcorn. It's not about that. He said, friends, love. Love is not about an emotion. Ultimately, it's about an action. It's about an action. It's about the act of the Father sending his Son to a planet that was filled with evil and sin and God-haters and rebellion who repeatedly did not in any way turn to God but lived our lives repeatedly living for ourselves. God sent his beautiful son onto this earth 2,000 years ago to be born as a baby, fully God, and yet fully man, to live a life as a carpenter in Nowheresville. And in the age 30, started to whisper to the world out there, started to proclaim, I am who you are looking for. I'm God. And started to just do Miracles of every kind, from weddings to those who were bleeding uncontrollably. He started pouring out his life for this wicked, rebellious earth. The light of the world had come. Jesus walks on water. Jesus commands storms to stop. Jesus raises the dead to the most undeserved of people in the world. These little ants on this speck of dust that God's created. The image of the invisible God as we heard earlier. It's created it. Jesus created it. walks on earth. He walks on earth. Spotless. Morally perfect. He walks amongst us to show us who God is. God sent his son. My God, let those words affect us. I am, me and Josie are now just starting to think about Sending, Jos uh, sending, Josie, sending Daisy to primary school. And as soon as you think about it, start thinking, you think, well, make sure, she, she needs to go somewhere really good. Yeah, somewhere as nice as possible. God didn't think that. He looked at planet Earth. He was like, whoa, that's not a good place. But I love them. I love them, Jesus. There you go. The Father sent 
his son to this earth to save us. To show us God in a world full of confused people to demonstrate who God is. And yet there's one little still piece of the jigsaw missing. Still one little issue of the entire sin of the world. There's still the issue of what does God do? He may show us who God is. He may demonstrate phenomenal love. He may heal people temporarily for their sicknesses. But this is the issue. The wrath of God is still coming. Rightly. What can we do? And this is where the second half of the verse is just the greatest news we could ever hear. He sent his son to show us God, yes, but to be the the propitiation (laughs) for our sins. A long, strange word with one awesome meaning. That when Jesus Christ died, that he repeatedly predicted, when he died, it was no normal death. The Bible tells us, and this is just where it's so impossible to comprehend. The Bible tells us that all of Tom Shaw's sin, past, present, and even yet to come, was somehow placed upon Jesus. The perfect one, the spotless one. God himself on earth, fully God, fully man. That when Jesus died, he didn't just die a death. But that at that moment, the entire weight of the sin of the world, past, present, and yet to come, was lifted and placed on Jesus. 2 Corinthians tells us, and we sang it, he became sin. He didn't just flirt with sin. He didn't just have sin temporarily be there. He became drenched in the sin of the world. The one who had never had a lustful thought, was drenched in the, lustful, in the sin of the lustful thoughts of this world. The one who had never given in to pride, the sin of people's pride, was drenched upon him. Him who had never acted in sinful violence. The sin of the entire world, sinful violence, was placed on him. Every sin was placed on him. So that the wrath of God that was being which was hurtling towards Tom Shaw and each of us here and everyone who's ever lived, could be diverted. This is what that long, strange word means. That Jesus was a propitiation for our sins. It means that the wrath of God was diverted onto him. It means that the wrath of God, it wasn't swept under the carpet. It wasn't sidelined and pretended to be an embarrassing thing. It was satisfied in Jesus the rightful wrath of God for all the injustice that that has ever occurred in this world was poured upon him. So that when Bill, thinking of all the injustice that his father had committed against him, the gospel tells him, you don't have to pretend it's been swept under the carpet. You don't have to pretend you should just get over it. It has been satisfied. Bill's father's sins, past, present, and future, have been placed on Jesus, and he had activated forgiveness and therefore seen the wrath of God diverted away from him. That this great gospel is the answer for any of us. You may be here today and you may think of all the things in my life I've done. Is this, can this really be true? Can this really be true? Yes. And you may be sitting here thinking, oh, I don't feel like I've had done that many bad things. Well, pride is the worst sin, the Bible tells us. So that needs to be placed on Jesus as well. And the Bible tells us that we can, by grace, we can receive Jesus' righteousness as he has been clothed in our sin. It's absolutely scandalous. Spurgeon A great preacher said this, he says, How does Christ deliver us from the coming wrath? He does it by putting himself into our place. It's like he looks at the coming wrath, coming down, at Nicky Duffy. He sees it coming and he goes, No! No! Father, 
clothe me in her sin. I will take the punishment for her sin. And he sees John the Roebuck and he sees all the sin of his life, even the sins yet to come. And it's like Jesus, he sees all the sin, the wrath of God coming towards it and his love for John says, no, no, Father, me, me, I know I've never sinned. I know I don't deserve it. Let me take the punishment. Let me take the righteous wrath of God for all his sin. And so it goes on. Jesus, our substitute, our great substitute. Spurgeon goes on, he says, Oh, this blessed plan of salvation by substitution, that Christ would take a poor, guilty sinner and set him up there in the place of acceptance and joy at the right hand of God, and that in order to be able to do so, Christ would say, Here comes the great flood of almighty wrath, I will stand where it is coming and let it flow right over me. And you know that at the cross it did overflow him until he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And then until he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then when he cried, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He bore so that you might never bear his father's righteous wrath. Jesus Christ was drenched in the wrath of God because of his phenomenal action demonstrating love for every single person who has been born, who is alive right now, and will be born. And if you're sitting here today and you might be a Christian, you might think, But Tom, at times I struggle from condemnation. At times I feel like God's wrathful at me. It's a lie. His wrath is not being poured out on you in that way. He does lovingly discipline us at times. But it's not the same. If you imagine at the cross, it was like a huge sponge full of God's righteous wrath. It was squeezed and drenched Jesus. And now... Every last drop has gone. And now when he stands over you, there's nothing left to be poured over you. Sure, he'll lovingly at times show us things that we need to see, but his wrath has been satisfied. And so we can approach the throne of grace by grace, knowing that now no longer anything separates us. God hasn't swept it under the carpet. Justice has been done so that you today, brothers and sisters, can approach him in a moment as we break bread now with reverence and deep, profound gratitude. And if you don't know Jesus here today, this is your day that you can say, I get that. I get it. I get it. If God is holy and I'm not, I'm in trouble and I need a saviour and Jesus, Jesus is my only saviour. And today I want to say, Please, 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 I implore you, be reconciled to God. Come today. Come and respond to what you've heard. Don't leave it another day. Don't leave it another moment. Do it today. Come and talk to me. Come and talk to Hugh. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Let's love Jesus for what he's done. Lord, we honour you. Maybe if the band could just come up and be ready to to play gently. Lord, we honour you. We honour you, Jesus the great perfect one, the perfect one. Lord, we don't lightly, Lord Jesus, talk about our salvation. We don't, Lord Jesus, we don't believe it was a cheap thing. We believe it was priceless. Lord, we say today, we, with all reverence, we thank you with all of our hearts for what you've done. And we say, Jesus, today, even as we break bread now, let it mean in our hearts, all that you would want it to mean. I pray for those today, Lord, who have suffered wrong condemnation and allowed maybe even Satan's lies just to bring them down, Lord. Today, break them into a new liberty of knowing your wrath has been dealt with. I pray today for all your sons today, your daughters here today, who know you, who have been forgiven and reconciled with you. I pray today for new depths of awareness of our sonship and our daughtership. 